рад приветствовать вас, уважаемые братья и сестры. Я приветствую вас именем Господа Иисуса Христа. Будьте благословенны. Дорогие, кто присутствует в этом зале, пусть особое Божье присутствие будет здесь. Те, кто смотрят онлайн, там, где вы находитесь, будьте благословенны. Мы сегодня празднуем один из самых великих праздников Библии. День Пятидесятницы. Day of the Pentecost. Хочу сказать, пау сделать паузу. And I will make a pause here. Уважаемые, день Пятидесятниц это это не праздник пятидесятилетних людей. And dear ones, I want to tell you that this day of the Pentecost is not celebrating fifty years of people on this earth. Это день сошествия Святого Духа. Это величайший праздник. Это день основания церкви. Слава Господу. Аллилуйя. Аллилуйя. Иисус дал два подарка для, для человечества. Иисуса Христа Спасителя. И когда Иисус уходил на небеса, heaven, Он сказал, Отец мой приготовил для вас великий сюрприз. И этим сюрпризом был, было пришествие Святого Духа. Давайте обратимся к Слову Божьему. Деяния апостолов, вторая глава. При наступлении Дня Пятидесятницы все они были единодушно вместе. When the day of the Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. И внезапно сделался шум с неба, как бы от несущегося сильного ветра, и наполнил весь дом, где они находились. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of the violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. И явились им разделяющиеся языки, как бы огненные, и почили по одному на каждом из них. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. И исполнились все Духа Святого и начали говорить на иных языках, как Дух давал им провещевать. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in their tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Это величайшее событие в жизни церкви. It is such a great day in the church of the in the life of the church. Уважаемые братья и сестры, дорогая церковь. And dear brothers and sisters, dear church, it is the beginning of the flowing of a new river. Wherever the Holy Spirit is calling us to come. And we, were, we are going to be in the, um, in the arms of this river. And I believe that this presence of the Lord is here in this place. The Lord said, where two or three of you are gathered in my name, I am there. And I know that some of us are sorrowful to hear that we still have to be remain in distance from each other. Иисус даже не только рядом с нами находится. But listen to this, Jesus is not just near us. Он Духом Святым находится в нас. With the Holy Spirit, He's inside of us. В нас внутри. Inside of us. Он вдохновляет нас внутри. He encourages inside us. Это величайшее благословение. And it is the greatest blessing. Для того, чтобы пережить Пятидесятницу снова. And in order to relive this Pentecost again. Первый стих говорит, они были единодушно вместе. The first uh, uh, verse says that they were together in one spirit. Lord, give us this communion of one spirit and unity in this church. Without unity, the, pour, the pouring out cannot come from the spirit. And the second verse starts that there was a sound that came from heaven. I think, I think, God, we Мы ждем этого шума с небес. And I'm thinking to myself, I once again want to hear the sound from heaven. Мы жаждем тебя, и Дух Святой. We are thirsting for you, Holy Spirit. Мы хотим Spirit. иметь общение с тобою. We want a fellowship with you. Мы хотим войти в эту реку благодати. We want to enter into this river of grace. Мы хотим, чтобы небеса зашумели снова. We want the heavens to roar again. Как это было в день 
Пятидесятницы. Just like it was on the day of Pentecost. Чтобы снова повторилась Пятидесятница. So that once again Pentecost could come. И следующее написано: явились разделяющиеся языки, как бы огненные. And the next we see it says that there seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came. Это все нормально, когда мы говорим, что мы должны быть огненными христианами. And this is all fine to say that we need to be on fire as Christians. И в духе святом есть огонь. And in the Holy Spirit there is fire. И кто-то из великих проповедников сказал, что для каждой головы, для каждого христианина у Бога есть огонь. And one of the famous preachers says that for every head, for every Christian there is fire from the Lord. Не угашайте этого огня. And do not put out this fire. И наполнились все духа святого. And so everybody was filled with the Holy Spirit. Позвольте сегодня духу святому наполнить нас. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill us today. Пусть это будет не очередной праздник. And let us this not celebrate just another holiday. Let's something special happen today. And let us just go into the atmosphere of grace. Let us continue to fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit again. In order to relive through this unity with the Holy Spirit. And we sing so often that Holy Spirit without you we can't do anything. Что мы делаем, без него нам трудно делать. It is difficult to do anything without him. Петь, to sing, поклоняться, to worship, жертвовать, to offer. О, особенно жертвовать нам всегда не, не хочется, когда на нас нет помазания. Especially to give, we never want to do this if there's not an anointing over it. Проповедникам тяжело проповедовать, когда нет его присутствия. It is difficult for preachers to preach when there is no presence. Каждое слово раздражает. Each word is just irritating. Но когда приходит он, but when he comes, это так все легко делается. Everything is so easy. С любовью, с желанием, with desire. И тогда это есть эффект. And there's an effect on what we're doing. Lord, help us again to be spiritual people. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. Dear Pentecostals, I call you today. Today and every day from now on to search for these new relationships. With the Holy Spirit. And the Bible speaks about a new fresh and I speak about the new relationship with the Holy Spirit let us rise and bow our heads and seek his presence bless the service and the group and everybody who will be preaching возносим тебя, Боже, благодарю тебя за величайший подарок от Отца Небесного, Дух Святой, благодарю тебя, и мы не только слышали о нем, мы знаем, мы много раз вкусили, как благ ты, Господь, благодарю тебя, благодарю тебя, благословляю твое имя, Боже, пусть течет сегодня эта река благодати, присутствие твоего, силы твоей, свежести твоей, Боже, в этом собрании Боже, возьми в удел группу прославления, возьми в удел э, Сергея, который будет проповедовать, возьми в удел наши уста, Господи, возьми, Боже, наше сердце, мы открываем его для Тебя и благословляем Твоим именем, Господи, каждого, кто в этом собрании, кто смотрит онлайн, благослови Господь, мы молимся во имя Иисуса Христа, аминь.
to this place of filling the atmosphere with excitement and all of you. We just thank you for the miracles that you've already performed within this place. And we honor you and we praise you. Open up our hearts. Fill it with love and mercy. Father God, open up our eyes to see you, the real you. Eyes to hear and ears to hear. Let us hear your still, small voice. We just honor you in your presence, in your loving arms. We thank you. Our fight is with weapons unseen. Your enemies crash to their knees as we cry out in worship.
God, and you call us to be worthy of your blood and your body, Father, that your grace is sufficient, Jesus, that you see the conditions of our heart, Father, that you love us no matter what, Father. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice you gave us, God, that you are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of our lives. Jesus will be done in worship of you, Lord God. Let our fleshly desires die, for you are good, for you are holy and blameless, Lord God, and without blemish, Jesus, that we love you, Jesus, that we hope to stand before you, Lord God, on the day that you come to take us back, Father. We love you, we stand before you in your kingdom. We give you all the glory, Lord God. i awesome. 
this place. We thank you that we can gather here in peace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for your faithfulness and your abundant mercy, God. We thank you that we could gather here today and to worship your son. We thank you for always, God, leading us out of troubles and trials and break down the walls of Jericho, God, leading the Israelites out of Egypt. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for showing us our pow your power. Father, we pray for this nation. We pray for peace in the local government, in the state government, in the federal government, Father. We pray for unity. We pray your light expose the darkness. Let your light overcome, God. We pray for the all the violence, all the anger. Just end, Father. Let there be peace within the nation. Let the nation turn to you. Be led to salvation and holiness and righteousness. Let the times of refreshing fall upon the land, God. We bless your name. We thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Uh, Brian, can you get my Bible? <laughs> thank you so much. Church, it's amazing to be here. God bless you all. All of our beautiful faces covered in masks. Thank you so much. Oh, praise God. Thank, praise God that we can gather here today and just worship Jesus. I don't think people realize how much of a blessing it is that the Holy Spirit moved and they allow churches to reopen Massachusetts. Even if it's 40% with masks and disinfection, Jesus' name is being glorified and we're united and God's kingdom will spread. Hallelujah. I'm going to Mark chapter 12, verse 41. I'm going to read. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many people who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she put out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. So... This honestly is uh, an amazing scripture. So what happens is the apostles are gathering money for their missions. And Christ is there with them and people are coming up and giving them money. But what happens is that poor widow gives very little amount of money and Christ recognizes it. And honestly, it's a very dangerous scripture. When you read this, it says, I Surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they put all for they all put in out of their abundance. But she put out of her poverty all that she had. You see, when I read this, I don't think the point is that I will never encourage people to take everything and all they have on their bank accounts and just pour into the church and hope for the best. I wouldn't encourage that. Because the Bible actually tells us to give according to what we have. That's what the scriptures tell us. So if, so if very rich people are giving very little, it's actually not scriptural. The Bible says give according to what you have, the measure of of what you have but one thing I do want us to notice in the scripture is is that Jesus notices the circumstances of the woman you see two quadrants is equivalent to two dollars it's about two dollars or one quadrant is about two dollars see the two mites so worldly speaking men they were probably getting offerings of like two thousand dollars four thousand dollars they were probably getting pretty big offerings from the rich people and in the wisdom of men, people would be like, who cares if there's two dollars? You know, if we, if we, you can just take that right out. We don't, we don't need that. But we got the other finances. That's what we want. That's what we need. But Jesus teaches, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who have given to the treasury. Which is amazing because the whole point of this is the fact that God notices. God notices our circumstances. He's not a God standing there with his arms folded and saying, where's your paycheck? I want it all. Like, he's not folding. He's not saying, that, oh, you didn't give your, you know, 2000 He's not saying, no, he notices your circumstances. He notices the sincerity of your heart. And he knows, he want, he, you can see how much of a loving father he is through Christ. He, he recognizes the poor widow's circumstances. I want us to just encourage us all 
to kind of be like that widow. She understood one thing. That two, those two dollars that she had, it would maybe feed her belly. But there are men out there who are ministering the kingdom of God, advancing the gospel. So she understood that, that these two dollars will go so much further in the kingdom of God. So she, she understood that, and that's why she gave it to Jesus. She, she was focused on the next life, not on this life. And I, just, I want all of us to understand this life is temporary. And, and obviously right now during times, there's people, out, there's people who go to our church who lost their jobs through all this. There's some who have more jobs, some who have less jobs. I want to tell you God understands your heart. He recognizes your circumstances. He reckon, he's not going to stand their arms full and say, oh, you're weaker than the others, you're nothing to me. No, Jesus says, you've given more because he recognizes, he understands your sincerity. So I want us all to just, when we collect offering, let us be sincere with everything we have. Let's be thankful and let us understand that we're giving not to just a basket and money just magically just disappears and God's pleased. No, we're giving to a community that preaches the gospel. We're give, this is an organization to advance God's kingdom. This is the brotherhood. When we're coming here, we're, 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 the spirit within us naturally wants to give because this is a place where God's kingdom is being spread. And that's what happened with the widow. She understood that God's kingdom is being spread. So that's why she naturally just gave what she had. I just want to encourage all of us, let's just give according to what we have with sincerity, with love, and trusting that God's kingdom will be spread. Father, I bless your name. I thank you for this place. I thank you that we can gather here. I thank you that there's men here who worship you and the men and women who worship you day and night, God, who are seeking your face and trying to advance the kingdom, God. I pray for these finances, the finances of this church will be organized and efficient, Father, that they be, every dollar be used to glorify the name of your son. Father, I pray for your kingdom to come and your will be done. I bless the rest of the service and bless whoever the speaker is. I pray let him speak the word of God with power and your truth to glorify your name, Father. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. I hope you guys gave with excitement. And I really believe this is going to be another powerful service. We just finished our service. There was a morning service. And guys, the power of God was so powerful at the service. I remember during time of worship, God began to speak during the sermon. The whole service was just so power-packed. And I believe we go from glory to glory. God continues to bless his people. Amen. You know, guys, one thing I want to begin with. My saying is this, I know that um, maybe a few of you saw that meme or this joke on, on social media that there was this confused, sort of a, not confused, but sort of a picture of this lady who's looking puzzled and confused. And, and on the bottom it says, I wonder what chapter of Revelation we are going to experience today. And I feel like with, a little bit of reaction to the first service, and I feel like with... Um, with the this year 2020 it has been a very interesting year from the beginning when we when we read all over the news that australia was on fire and it was the biggest one they have ever had to a killer virus that now has taken hundreds of thousands of lives that has taken the lives of people that we know and that we know many people who have severely suffered from this virus uh, even to some killer hornets that came, and that was just crazy. I still don't get what, what happened there. And right now, with all the riots that are happening, it's, it almost seems like America is almost at war. I know I had a few friends who... It's one thing when, when you see on the news riots, you're like, wow, this is terrible. But a few of my, my friends who lived in Rochester and other places where they're downtown, they're just taking videos and of what exactly is going on. And as I'm looking at this... I'm seeing this, um, it's almost, it seems like we're in a war zone. And it's, and it's almost seems like we as people of, of God, we're beginning to lose hope. And I remember during the morning service today, during the time of worship we had, I was amazed at the fact that 
It's as though I completely disconnected from what's happening around this world and connected to the Holy Spirit. And it was just so clean. The air so fresh. And I remember today during worship, same thing. You're just worshiping Jesus. And maybe the world is at war. And maybe there's, there's a virus that, that is killing hundreds and thousands of people. Maybe there's a fire somewhere out there. But we're standing in the presence of God with fullness of joy. And it is amazing. It is so powerful. I know that I watch the news quite a bit just to stay informed of what's, what exactly is happening in this world. But it is awesome to come in the presence of God and have the Holy Spirit completely refresh you, recharge you, regenerate you so we can go back into this world. We can go back into our everyday lives but with a positive attitude because we serve a powerful God. Amen. Today, guys, we are celebrating a very important festival or feast, as the Old Testament calls it, the Feast of Weeks. And as the New Testament, we call, we call it the Day of Pentecost, which is one of the most important events that has ever happened throughout history. It is when the Holy Spirit descended on the church. And it is when the church, and it is when the, when the peoples, when the scales fell off the eyes of the people, where they no longer had just Jesus with them but they had the Holy Spirit inside of them and it is such an amazing thing that happened here 2,000 years ago that now we are living here many many years later and we're sitting here at church and enjoying the very fruits of what happened there 2,000 years ago at the day of Pentecost and one thing that is actually good when you preach us uh, the second time same sermon and one day is that you, you, you get to sharpen up things that you need, things that you don't need. And one thing that I didn't talk about this morning that I want to share about today is if we open up to Leviticus chapter 23. That is Leviticus chapter 23 verse 15 through verse, I believe, 17. My Bible says these words. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. And you shall bring your dwellings with two loaves, wave loaves, and two tenths of the ephah. And they shall be like fine flour, and they and they shall be baked with laven, and they are first fruits to the Lord. Kind of confusing portion of, of scripture, but like I said before, this celebration of the Feast of Weeks, as we just read, is the same celebration of the Day of Pentecost. It was what being celebrated during the same time. And I believe the more and more you study the Bible, the more and more you read the Bible, the more you understand the depth and the riches of God's Word. And you understand there is so much symbolism in almost everything that you read. You might be reading a story of a certain character in the Bible, not realizing it's, com it's, the complete, it's completely symbolic to who Jesus is. You might be reading an event that it just doesn't make sense to you, but it's something that is completely symbolic to something that happens in the future. And that is just the beauty of God's Word. And over here, this is talking about the first fruits that were offered to the Lord. What's amazing over here, I was just talking about this with my wife before the service, is that, is that the first fruits that were offered in this specific feast, which is again the day of Pentecost, we read in the New Testament, but this specific feast, they offered wheat. They offered a harvest. And we see over and over again in the scriptures that that is symbolic of souls. It was an amazing portion of scripture that 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 we notice here today that I didn't mention in the first service is that they offered two loaves of bread. Not one, two loaves of bread. And I believe that symbolically this is speaking the day of Pentecost that this harvest was not just for the Jewish people but it was for the Gentile people. The two loaves of bread symbolizes one loaf is to the, is to the Jew and the other one is to the Gentile. And here we see the week of feasts, in other words, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended into this earth. When the, when the Holy Spirit descended to dwell among men, it was not just for the Jewish people, but it was for the Gentiles. 
What is amazing with that is Jesus said these words even when Gentiles came to him asking him um, to be healed and asking, asking him for certain requests. Jesus answered them and said, hey, I was sent but only to the lost house of the house of Israel. And yes, because of God's divine mercy, he still healed a Gentile because he was merciful. But he, Jesus, came, like he said, in the scripture, only to the house of Israel. And here we see two loaves of bread, two harvests being offered up to the Lord as it is not just the Gentile, but it, but it is not just the Jewish race, but it's only, it's also to the Gentiles. So for us guys, it's really, really important to understand that what we're celebrating here, this this celebration, which is the Holy Spirit descending, is simply a harvest of souls not of ju just Jews but of the Gentiles and another another um, meaning of this feast or the day of Pentecost is the renewal of a covenant literally if you read commentary about about the celebration of feasts or the feast of weeks it is a renewal of a covenant and now we are symbolically looking over here as a day of pentecost as the same celebration as a new covenant being born and that new covenant is is the covenant of the last days from the time when the holy spirit descended to the time jesus is coming back for his church this covenant is called the new covenant or the last days and we read that the prophet Joel prophesies and says in the last days says the Lord I will pour out my spirit on all flesh in the last days which is the new covenant which was introduced in the day of Pentecost and which was not introduced only to the Jewish people but it was introduced to the Gentiles and my brothers my sisters how awesome it is that we can partake in this covenant that in this covenant there is life in this covenant we are free forgiven by the power of Jesus Christ come on guys that is powerful that is amazing you know the Holy Spirit is so powerful I believe that in our days I actually thank God at the power at the message of the Holy Spirit is coming back to the church I remember I preached a similar message to this Oh, it was in later 2015 when I just moved back here from, from Texas. And I remember I was preaching. I'm like, I do not hear sermons of the Holy Spirit anymore. It's, it, is, it is almost a forgotten message in the body of Christ. But now for the past few years, it is as though the message of the Holy Spirit has been rebirthed. And praise the Lord for that. The Holy Spirit is in our lives and He is moving powerfully. Amen. I want to guys give you a little story that I found to be quite amazing. We read and all throughout the Gospels of Jesus performing some of the most powerful miracles that we have ever, ever witnessed or even can comprehend. Like for example, if, if, I, if we talk about what happened in the tomb of Lazarus, a man that's been dead for days now, a man that already began to rot in his grave, and yet we read the amazing story of Jesus coming to this grave of a man who's been dead for days already, and with all power and with all authority saying these words, Lazarus come forth. And, a lot, and many people who were in that crowd heard these words, Lazarus come forth. Many of those same people knew who Lazarus was, including Jesus. That was their close friends. Many of the disciples personally knew who Lazarus was. And many of them knew that Lazarus has been dead for so many days. And when Lazarus was resurrected from the dead, it wasn't just it was very an, an ordinary miracle just because we see Jesus raise more people from, from the dead. But it's instantly. Here days has already passed. And we see some of the most amazing miracles. Lazarus being raised from the dead. But very sadly, this miracle did not change any one of them. This miracle that we see did not change the disciples. Did not change those who saw it happened. Same thing. 
on the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples, Peter saw Moses and Elijah physically with their eyes. They saw Jesus being trans, his image being transformed in front of his very own eyes. And he heard with his very own ears these words, this is my beloved son. He, words, he heard God's, God's audible voice. And yet when we look at the life of Peter, we read that he rejected, he denied Jesus three times just days later. We can read about a story, about a story in the Gospels of a massive storm. How the disciples are stuck in the middle of a sea in a massive storm. And they wake up the master. They wake up Jesus and they tell him these words, Master, Master, do you care that we perish? In other words, do you not care about what's going on? We're about to die and you're here um, sleeping in the middle of the storm. And maybe you're on that ship or in the boat and you see with your own eyes just like the disciples saw with their own eyes Jesus stand up with such authority, such boldness and he says these words and he calmed the storm and the wind stopped the rain stopped and the sea became calm and you saw every one of those miracles and imagine none of those miracles changed your life wow or imagine maybe you just like Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and you took a few steps on the water yourselves. Guys, one step on the water makes sense because the first step you take in the water, you, you drown. But when you start walking on the water like Peter was walking, something like that should never ever leave your mind, yet they remained unchanged. And the reason why I say they remain unchanged is because when Jesus died, what did Peter say? Let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. It's like, wait just a second. Go fishing. She said that you'll be fishers of men. Let's go fishing. In other words, hey, boys, um, I know we've been together for the past three years. We had a great journey, but it's over. Jesus died. It's all over. Let's go fishing. And guys, it is so sad. And we see miracles upon miracles upon miracles. And we see the same people who yelled just weeks before Christ's crucifixion, yelled, Hosanna, 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 now days later are yelling, crucify him. Why? How? Very simple. Like the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, it is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by the Holy Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It is not by might. You can see all the might in the world, it will not change your life. You can see all the power in the world, it will not change your life. You can see all the miracles in the world, it will not change your life. You can see the dead raised. It will not change your life. Miracles are not meant to change your life. Miracles are meant to draw you closer to the one who can change your life. And that is the Holy Spirit. It is not by might. It is not by power. But it is by my spirit, says the Lord. My brothers, my sisters, I believe lately that the charismatic, I want to say lately, but for the past several years, very sadly, but the charismatic movement in America became so focused on miracles, I believe they're missing the very point of Christianity. They're so focused on what God can do for them. They're so focused on some miracle, on some spiritual high. Guys, we're not here for a spiritual high. If you're focusing on a spiritual high, you will have no faith. You will have no Christianity. All you will have is a big game. We as people of God need to understand that it is not by might. Don't focus on might. It is not by power. Don't focus on the power. But it is by my spirit, says the Lord. In Habakkuk chap, chap, uh, chapter 3, the Bible says these words. And it, it describes God in his fullness. It describes God 
in his authority. It talks about horns coming out of his hands, which signifies authority. It talks about his, that his light. It raided, it shone like his glory. And the Bible says these words, and there was the hiding of his power. And guys, we need to realize not by might. Power, not by power. In the presence of God was hidden his power. Not by might, not by power, but by the Holy Spirit. In the presence of the Holy Spirit is where you find power. If you focus on the power, you will never find the presence. If you focus on the presence, the power dwells there. Praise the Lord. One thing that for me was so touching is the story of, I think those of you who know history quite enough, you, you, you maybe might have heard of this very evil emperor called Nero. He was back in... Um, very early church, not long after Jesus was crucified, not long after the day of Pentecost, this is in, in Rome during the time of gladiators where, where they had the massive Colosseum that fit over 40,000 people. And again, very, very evil time in the land. Very, very evil time. And what happens is quite interesting because in those times, Nero was such an evil emperor that he took Christians. And he would force them to deny Jesus. He would force them to deny to deny that Jesus was ever alive, to deny faith in Jesus. And if they would not deny their faith in Jesus, it would be like a celebration to, to, to the Romans where they would put Christians inside this Colosseum with thousands of people cheering and screaming as lions would eat them alive unless they rejected Jesus. For me, it is so touching. I just don't get it. Because these people, history says that while the lions would be tearing them to pieces, they would sing songs unto the Lord. They would sing songs unto the Lord. And it doesn't make sense for me. How can these people who have never seen Jesus physically yet are willing to die for him. Yet we look at people like the disciples who were with Jesus physically, who walk with Jesus physically, who heard the voice of God himself say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The same disciples who walked on the water, the same disciples who saw Moses and Elijah, the same disciples, guys, the same disciples who received revelation that Jesus was the son of God, the same same disciple whose disciples who saw the dead being raised, the same disciples who left all of their business to follow Jesus, who sat at the feet of Jesus and learned from Jesus himself. Those same disciples said these words after Jesus died, let's go fishing again. Let's forget about all that Jesus said. Let's forget about all that Jesus taught. Let's forget about all that Jesus introduced to us and let us go fishing again. Forget everything that we learned. And the Bible says they all doubted. Peter, who told Jesus, I will be with you even in prison. I will be, you, I'll be with you even to the point of death. Death, the same Peter says, let's go fishing again. But something happens that these people in Rome, in Italy, who never saw Jesus, who never saw Jesus cleanse a leper, leper physically, who never heard the voice of God physically say, this is my son, who have never heard again God's voice physically who have never seen Moses and Elijah who have never saw God calm a storm who have never saw God produce any of these powerful miracles all those people in Rome never saw any of those things they've never saw Jesus physically face to face they've never heard God's voice audibly so authoritative 
They never heard these words, Lazarus, come forth. They never heard Jesus rebuke a storm. They never saw Jesus perform any of those miracles, yet those people were willing to die for Jesus. While the disciples says, who needs this? Let's go fishing again. What is going on? What are we missing here? One group of people who saw Jesus face to face, who saw the most amazing miracles, who have experienced God in every aspect, who have seen, who have seen bread multiply, who, who have seen fish multiply, who have seen water turn into wine, who have seen some of the greatest miracles turn around and say, we thought that he was the son of God. We thought that he was Son of God. Yet another group of people who never saw any of that would allow lions to tear them into pieces while they worship God and would never say no to Jesus. What happened? It is quite simple. It is very, very simple. The same Jesus that was with the disciples to thousand years ago was the same Jesus that was in those people who were in Rome but the difference is that disciples had the Jesus with them while the people in Rome had Jesus in him. Big big difference. It is good to have God with you. It is good to have Jesus with you but it's a big difference when he is in you. What happened on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit descended upon the church and we look at Peter. Look at Peter. Peter, just days ago, days before the day of Pentecost, stood there and in the same room, at the same area where Jesus was, rebuked him publicly. Not rebuked him, he denounced him. I don't know who this man is. Three times rebuked, denounced Jesus. Yet the same Peter, after the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, we can read, I believe it's from verse 13 of Acts chapter 2. The same Peter now stands with all boldness preaching the gospel and people began to get saved. What happened to Peter? What was the difference between the Peter that, that, uh, that said, Jesus, I will go to the cross with you. Jesus, I will die with you. Jesus, I will go to prison with you. What happened to the same Peter who did not find it worthy to be crucified like Jesus was crucified. So he was crucified upside down. What is the difference? Jesus was no longer with him, but Jesus was in him. That's the difference. When Jesus is with you, that's good. But when Jesus is in you in the form of the Holy Spirit, then this word, this Bible comes alive. And when Jesus is in you, to you, he is more real than he was to the disciples 2,000 years ago. To us today, Jesus is more real to us than he was to the disciples 2,000 years ago. Jesus was more real to those Christians in Rome while being eaten alive by lions. To them, Jesus was more real to them than he was to, to the disciples 2,000 years ago. Why? Because the spirit of the living God dwelt inside of them. My brothers and sisters, it is amazing that when Jesus was on this earth, we don't, we don't read much about, we read a lot about people get, um, being healed. A lot about multitudes, everyone was healed. We read a lot about cleansing lepers, some very creative miracles. We read a lot about that. We, we, we read about people being raised from the dead. We read about all these things. But what's shocking to me, what's amazing to me, that almost never you find after these amazing miracles happen that somebody says, hey Jesus, Master, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? They saw the greatest miracle, yet they did not desire salvation. Why? Because salvation without the Holy Spirit is impossible. Salvation without the Holy Spirit is impossible. I think Jer uh, Jeremiah prophesied and said that a new spirit shall I give them. 
a new heart shall I give them, a new spirit. When a person, when you get saved, you receive a new spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, we today, to us, Jesus is real. He is reality. And if, had Jesus not died 2,000 years ago, had he stayed alive to this very day, in order for you to see Jesus today, had he been alive, you would have to get a massive you have to be in a massive line somewhere in Israel waiting just to see Jesus. And I guarantee you that that line would be really, really long. You'd probably have to wait for half a year, for a year, waiting just to see Jesus. But what happened when Jesus died? That same Jesus now to us became reality. In other words, the same Jesus now in the form of the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. So who is the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit is Jesus without, without boundaries or limitations. Holy Spirit is Jesus without any limits. The same Christ, the same Holy Spirit that dwelt in Jesus now dwells in each and every one of us. And I want to point out something that's very, very important to all of us that I actually didn't share this this morning but I want to share a little bit now how could Jesus live a sinless life you say well because he was God he the Bible says that he became a man he experienced humanity in all his ways he took upon himself the likeness of a man in order for the sacrifice to be accepted by God in order for the blood to be accepted by God guys excuse me Sorry, I have this itch that's just not going, it's not going away. But in order for him, in order for the blood of Jesus to be accepted, Jesus became a man. And he fulfilled the law in being a man. And one thing I want to tell you is this. You, you might say, well, it's not fair because he was not, he was born of holy blood. I can say the same thing with Adam and Eve. They were created in perfection and holiness. They were created. The difference between Adam and Eve was simple. Adam and Eve were both pure and holy. Jesus was born into a very, very corrupt world. So had so Jesus probably had more of a chance to fail than Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve was just both of both of them and a snake. And yet Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus lived a sinless life. Jesus lived a life full of power as being a man. How? Very, very simple. Because the Holy Spirit was in him. You cannot fulfill the law. You cannot live holy. Impossible. We are corrupt. Like David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. You, we, when we are born, we are corruption. That's why the Bible says we ought to be born again. And when we were born again, like Jeremiah prophesied, we, it's a new spirit. When we were born again, we receive a new heart, a new spirit shall I give them, which is the Holy Spirit. And my brother, my sister, without the Holy Spirit, it is impossible to live a holy life. But with the Holy Spirit, you can live a holy life. With the Holy Spirit, you can overcome sin. With the Holy, with the Holy Spirit, you can forgive those who do you wrong. With the Holy Spirit inside of you, you can bless those who who curse you. You can love those who hate you. Maybe you can't do it, but the Holy Spirit inside of you can. Maybe you cannot forgive those who do you wrong, but the Holy Spirit inside of you can. And I'm here to tell you that you have a new heart. You have a new spirit. And that is the Holy Spirit. And all those things are possible to you because of the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you. Jesus came to this earth. How? How? Guys, had Jesus sinned? Had Jesus fallen into any sin, his blood would not be accepted. Had Jesus had fallen into any sin, his blood would not be accepted. 
Had there been any sin, any impurity found in Jesus, his blood would not have been able to pay for our lives. Guys, how thankful we have to be to the Holy Spirit for, for keeping Jesus, who was a man, for the power of the Holy Spirit that was inside of Jesus that kept him holy, kept him blameless, pure. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of us, maybe we struggle with certain sins. You cannot defeat it, but the Holy Spirit inside of you can. The Holy Spirit inside of you can. And my brother, my sister, Paul explains this very well. He explains the communion with the Holy Spirit. Communion, the Holy Spirit is unity, is it's it's togetherness, it's working together. All things are possible with God, not to God, but with God. It is a togetherness, it's that fellowship. Communion is that fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We in this life will fail. In this time, guys, that we are going through right now, with all this chaos going on, with all these riots going on, with this virus that is going on, with all this negativity that is going on. How amazing it is that we can sit here in a church so happy, so alive, so full of joy. Guys, it is impossible to the average person, but it is possible for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you. It is possible for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you. Guys, I am telling you, we are blessed to live in a time like this. We are blessed to live in a time like this where evil is all around us, but it does not affect us because we understand that we are a new creation in Christ. And that new creation is a creation of the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened here 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came down and the, uh, and the scales fell off of the eyes of the people. And suddenly all of the things that Jesus said to them began to make sense. We read in in John chapter 16 verse 7, Jesus said these words, And I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comfort will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he will come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they have not believed in me of righteousness because I go to my father and you will see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged I have yet many things to say unto you but you cannot bear them now but when the but when he the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatever he shall hear that he shall speak and he will show you things to come. Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go away. Why? Because if when I go away, I will send a spirit of truth to you. And again, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness. In other words, he, the Holy Spirit, will convict you of your sin and draw you into repentance. And what does the Bible say? Jesus says, I have many things to say unto you, but I can't. If you read uh, John 14, 15, 16, all these chapters, Jesus is teaching them. He's teaching them parables. He's, te he's teaching them the, the kingdom. He's teaching them all these principles. And he comes to this. He says, listen, I have so much I want to tell you, but you, you just will not get it until the Holy Spirit comes. And guys, I can only imagine what happened on the day of Pentecost. I can only imagine what happened on this glorious day when suddenly the Holy Spirit descended on those in the upper room. And all the people that are sitting there, they're like, whoa, now we understand what Jesus said. Now we understand what Jesus was talking about. Now we remember every miracle that happened wow that was so deep what what Jesus was sharing because the Holy Spirit and when he descended on them all of the sudden the very things that Jesus spoke to them became alive this very word the very words of Jesus became alive and you can see Peter such a big transformation in the life of Peter because Peter told Jesus that he would again die with him then he rejected Jesus three times then Peter said these words well I'm just gonna go fishing again because all of this was false and now the same Peter in the same chapter Acts 
chapter 2 this same Peter that has done so much wrong now stands there face to face with such boldness stands face to face with the Israelites and say the same Jesus whom you crucified was both Lord and it, who was both the king and the Lord and when he spoke those words with such boldness do you know what happened 3,000 people say Peter what must we do to be saved Peter what must we do to be saved Jesus preached a sermon on the mountain with 5,000 men and thousands of women and children not one person said what must I do to be saved Peter preached a sermon 3,000 people what must I do to be saved why number one without the Holy Spirit there is no salvation now but number two the Holy Spirit came and all of a sudden everything that Jesus said makes sense all everything that Jesus said it falls it it's it now makes sense what am I saying the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth he shall reveal God's word to you and we talked in the beginning of the sermon I mentioned how again the two loaves of bread Gentiles and Jewish people and also the celebration or the feast of weeks meant that they would they would offer unto the, the Lord are very specific offerings. They were, they were offering their first fruits and the first fruits were what was was offered in wheat and in other words their harvest and we can see that when the Holy Spirit descended when that covenant became active the first thing we see is the first fruits of the covenant which which was thousands of souls thousands of people getting saved my brother and sister the day of Pentecost is an amazing celebration where we remember that the Holy Spirit descended where we honor the fact that the Holy Spirit descended to this earth and that he revealed to us who Jesus really truly is and now we see now there are so many people in this life who are willing to give their lives for Jesus we have we have known martyrs I know that those are those are always mentions the fact that how many martyrs there are how many people there are in China who have who are being killed who are in concentration camps because of Jesus all they have known in their life was misery all that they known in their life was persecution yet they would gladly die for Jesus why because to them Jesus is more real than he was to the disciples 2,000 years ago the Holy Spirit makes Jesus real to you the Holy Spirit reveals this book to you I know I shared this story earlier but I'll share it again a few of my a few of my, my brothers we went to Yale University very prestigious university I think all of you should know what this university is and we were just talking to a few Russian students over there and they majored in in actually the study of of, of the Bible and when we were talking to them, we were amazed at how much they knew of the Bible. They knew the whole history. They knew the Torah. They knew the prophets. They knew the judges. They knew like all the years and everything. We were amazed at them. They were like, wow. Like, so are you guys pastors? Are you guys ministered, ministers? And they looked at each other. They started laughing. They're like, are you guys really believe in this? It's a history book. We're like, like really? It's, like, it's a history book. And they just laughed it off. And all that means is this, without the Holy Spirit, the Bible is a closed book. Without the Holy Spirit, the Bible is a book of poetry, a book of history, a book of wars, book of politics. Without the Holy Spirit, the Bible is just another book. But with the Holy Spirit, the Bible comes alive. It is the same thing. The, when the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to you God's word, it is the same thing that happened the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago when the Holy Spirit descended and the, and the people's eyes were open to exactly what the Bible said about being bold, about laying down your life for Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit came 2,000 years ago, we see in Peter, 
boldness came alive in him and he began to preach the word of God in boldness and God began to save that which was lost and like I mentioned before the same Peter who denied Jesus three times was the same Peter that said I am not worthy to be crucified like Peter crucify me upside down like Jesus crucified me upside down same Peter what is the difference one Peter had Jesus with him the other one had Jesus in him a lot of us Christians we have Jesus with us in other words when we need him here he is in other words we, we come to church and we're around Jesus but my brother and my sister Jesus needs to be inside of us and that is the new heart that is the new spirit that Jeremiah prophesied amen let's all of us stand up and, and pray let's just invite the Holy Spirit into our lives and his guidance into our lives and believe that the Holy Spirit can do a mighty work in us father we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus we come before you this Sunday afternoon and we thank you Almighty Jesus that your glory that the Holy Spirit he descended into this earth that he descended here 2,000 years ago and that he is here and we thank you the Holy Spirit revealed to us Jesus who you you are he revealed to us your love he revealed to us your character he revealed to us your life and we thank you for the Holy Spirit that is with us that convicts us of our sin that leads us into righteousness that is there that is the still small voice that is there in times of need we thank you Holy Spirit that you are guiding us all the days of our lives that you're guiding us Lord on what to do on the path that we should walk in on the people that we ought to become. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here. And we pray, Almighty God, that you would lead this church in the path in which you have predestined the church to walk into. That you would lead this church into the path which you want us to walk by. And let us be a, a obedient to your word and sensitive to where you are leading us. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. We honor you. And God's people said a mighty amen. amen. Hallelujah. amazing and powerful heard we heard amen thank you Serge it's so amazing to hear a word like that when we really should not be seeking after supernatural things miracles healings manifestations but we should be truly seeking after the true heart of God who he really is inside of us and who saves us and it's so amazing that we can be here together again finally worship together hear the living word together in our church and I'm so glad we go to this church because everybody is so loving and wants to minister to all of our hearts um, it's a really blessed time to be here so we're going to pray for our birthdays if we can put them up on the screen Emma Sergejczyk, Svetlana Dimoglu, Nina Romanovskaya, Lyubov Vlasyuk, Tatyana Lyubizhanina, Jana Varabey, Nadezhda Seminovich, Pavel Dervinchuk, Annalie Olberg, Daniel Shandrin, Maxim Joshan, Alexandra Panchenka, Nadezhda Chibutaro, Yelena Ivanov, Yelena Gardienka, Yuri Kalina, and Vladimir and Tatiana Kavalchuk, 17 years of marriage, congratulations. So we're all gonna rise. I know that we can't be here together, you know, we can't have our brothers and sisters come up, but let's stretch our hands towards them wherever they are, bless them just with more love and more anointing and more of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Let us rise. Jesus, we praise you. We thank you so much for our brothers and sisters that we are able to be here together, Lord. We stretch our hands out to them and we bless them, Father, wherever they may be, Jesus. If they are at home, if they are in this place, Lord, we ask you to have more anointing in their lives, Jesus. Give them more love from heaven, more love towards each other, Father. Let them grow in the spirit even deeper, Lord. Let them get more revelations and more knowledge of who you are, Jesus. Put that seed inside of them 
them. Let the Holy Spirit lead them in their daily lives, Lord. Let them prosper. Let them have a daily anointing, Father. Let the living water flow over their lives, Jesus. We bless your name. We thank you that they are here with us, Lord. We ask you, just give them health, healing, whatever they may need in this time, Jesus. But more so, let them fellowship with you in their daily lives and seek your face daily. And honestly, God, we bless them and we bless your name. Amen. So you may be seated. I'm not going to keep you here for too long. We have some announcements. Um, the first, and we're going to keep repeating these, we continue to be in this kind of quarantine phase one or phase two at this point with special rules. And we must continue to stay six feet apart from each other, wear masks as we are when we are walking by each other. When we are exiting, please, please do it in an orderly manner so you are six feet apart. We cannot loiter in the halls. We cannot gather like we usually do in fellowship, unfortunately. I'm sure there will be a time that we can do this, but it's not coming just yet. Um, if you are elderly or sick, we urge you to stay home and watch online with us and tune in. We don't want to allow the sickness to get a hold of anybody. We don't want to be responsible for this. So just please make your own judgment in this. And I know that we have a tradition to embrace one another, hug each other, shake hands, kiss one another, but we have to refrain from this as well for now, unfortunately. Um, we are going to be disinfecting after every service, just like we did last week. And we thank the disinfecting teams who have already done this. You are doing such an amazing job and we, it, it's really needed and we thank you so much. We have baptism classes tonight at 5, so there is still time to sign up. We were hearing the word today about the descending of the Holy Spirit and the baptism in the Spirit. Yes, we need to be baptized in the Spirit and also in water. It is so important, and um, it's a public declaration to everybody that we gave our lives up to Jesus. Um, our service tonight in the evening is at 5 p.m. We continue to live stream all of our services that are here. So if you cannot make it, if you're on the road, please tune in. We welcome you. And tonight at 7 p.m., we will have a Zoom meeting with all of the ministers. Um, there are a ton of things to be discussed and to continue to keep each other updated on everything that's going on. Starting next week on Sunday, we will have new service times. So our traditional service is going to be now at 10 a.m. like it was prior to this. So please make sure you make that change. The English service that we are at right now will be at 1 p.m. And then our regular Russian service will be at 6 p.m. So please take note of these times. And we do have communion next week. We will do this. We are going to use those personalized cups that we have during the self-isolation quarantine time. If you cannot attend the communion services next week, Please reach out to your deacons or your ministers, and we will get you those cups so you can still uh, partake in this communion, and we can do this together in unity. So we invite all of you to get involved in ministry. There is so much to do for the kingdom of God. So let us do this together and continue to expand the kingdom. If you want to be involved in worship or you want to preach or you want to translate or you want to partake in the sanitization of the church disinfection, please come up to one of the ministers. Anybody, we will get you more information. And so that's all for the announcements. Let us rise and conclude the service in prayer. Jesus, we glorify your name. We thank you. We thank you so much that your Holy Spirit is in this place, that you give us a living word every week, that you are continuing to bless us every day, that you continue to save us and protect us, Jesus. No matter how much iniquity we have inside of ourselves, Lord, we bless you and we thank you. I ask you, Jesus, just pour out your blessing and your protection over this church for the rest of this week, Lord. We started this week off with you, and we want to continue to seek your face every day this week, Jesus. We we bless you. We honor you. We thank you, Jesus. We glorify your name. And all of God's people said, amen. Be blessed. We will see you tonight at 6 p.m. 5 p.m., I'm sorry. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light. In the kingdom of light Forever under your dominion You're the king of my life You're the king of my life You reign above it all You reign above it all Over the universe and over every heart There is no 
You reign. 